Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to Successes and Challenges in Bringing Performance to Java with Inline Types. I'm Sharon. I've been a software developer for the OpenJ9 team at IBM for a couple years now since graduating from university. And today in this talk, we'll explore the thinking behind how inline types have been designed and implemented to align with modern hardware and extend the Java language. And we'll touch upon the challenges of introducing such a fundamental change to a longstanding programming language like Java. We'll be avoiding the exact specifics of the implementation as development is ongoing and features are constantly evolving. First, we'll look at why inline types were introduced. Then we'll go over what they are. And finally, we'll talk about how inline types have been designed and implemented and discuss what they have to offer in terms of performance. So first, why inline types? To better understand why inline types are a crucial enhancement to Java, we'll go over how hardware has evolved, but how memory latency is still a bottleneck, how Java can be strengthened in terms of the developer experience, as well as language performance, and lastly, how Project Valhalla seeks to address these goals with inline types. In the 90s, when Java was conceived, the costs of fetching memory and doing an arithmetic operation were of comparable magnitude. But it's been some time since then, and CPUs have had sizable advancements in terms of processing instructions per CPU cycle. Compute power continues to improve over time. However, memory latency is still an ongoing problem. Although there have been improvements and there are always ways to reduce memory accesses, such as leveraging caches, memory latency is still an area where more can be done. Here's some data from a core i7-5500 processor, and it represents optimistic scenarios, such as assuming that a cache line is not shared with another processor. At the register level, the latency is representative of roughly a single CPU cycle. And as we go deeper into the caches, more CPU cycles are needed. If we dive even deeper into memory we, with increasingly larger sizes, we can see that the latency increases pretty drastically. For some more human understandable numbers, let's look at the scaled latency here. So from here, a few things we can deduce are, the smaller the cache, the faster the access. It's beneficial for the data you want to access to be stored together. And if we reduce the amount of data being stored, then we can avoid having to allocate more memory. If we think about Java's approach of everything is an object with the exception of primitive values, that methodology was suitable for the memory layout in the early days of Java but it poses performance disadvantages for today's architecture. Here's a representation of what a typical Java heap can look like. This layout poses some issues for caching. As we can see, there's references everywhere. Objects are not necessarily stored for efficient access, or in other words, objects are not conveniently positioned near each other in memory, so accessing the objects can be inefficient. There's also lots of object headers, which contributes to footprint. And a large footprint means that we'll likely need more GC cycles and that we probably can't fit all the data into a single cache line. So cache misses become more likely. The GC does try to mitigate these issues, but we can also make improvements in the JVM as well with inline types. Now, aside from the performance perspective, inline types can also help us strengthen the Java language and give us more flexibility but we already have objects. What's so bad about them? In Java, object identity is useful since it helps us keep track of object state, allows us to mutate the object, and lets us acquire a monitor on the object. But there are many cases where we use an object simply as a data carrier, and identity is not needed since we won't mutate the values being stored. Keeping identity around contributes to header overhead, which seems pointless if we're not even using the identity. So let's cross that out. Okay, well, our good friends, the primitive types don't have identity, so why not just use them? Although the lack of identity helps us from a performance perspective, primitives are limited in the information we can represent and we can do better. So that's where inline types come in, like a sort of hybrid between primitives and traditional objects that codes like a class, giving us the flexibility to define fields and other aspects, but works like an int in terms of how it's stored in memory, inline. 
Of course, inline types don't have all the capabilities of classes and are not quite as performant as primitives, but the idea is to leverage the benefits of both types. Essentially, we can enhance the Java developer experience without sacrificing performance through inline types. Inline types is a core development in Project Valhalla, which is a series of prototypes focused on a few high level goals, namely advancing Java performance by improving memory layout efficiency, which is captured in this first goal here, and also to strengthen the Java language by enhancing abstraction, encapsulation, safety, expressiveness, and maintainability, which is captured in the second and third goals to implement generic specialization and to ensure Java compatibility with what Valhalla provides. Today, I'll be focusing on how inline types contribute to the first and third goals we see here. Now that we've briefly touched upon inline types, let's dive a little bit deeper into what they are. Inline types have some key characteristics that enable them to bring about the benefits of both objects and primitives, such as the characteristic of being flattenable. We'll also look at why the slogan codes like a class works like an int fits so well. Let's start off with the main characteristics. Firstly, inline types have no identity. That means that any two inline types with the same type and contents are considered the same thing. This is different than regular objects because two object references that were, can refer to similar data, but would be considered two different objects. Next, inline types are immutable. So once they're created, they can't be changed. And this is quite like primitives. If you want to change a value, then you create a new instance with the data you want. Lastly, inline types are flattenable, which means that the JVM can flatten or inline the data within its container. Overall, inline types share similar characteristics to primitives. At the same time, you can think of inline types as restricted classes, since they have limited capabilities compared to classes. But those limitations are also what makes inline types perform better than classes. Now we'll go over a simple example for flattening. Let's define a point as a regular object, which has two fields, x and y. And let's also define a line, which we capture with two point fields, start and end. We see that line holds two references, one for start and one for end. Now, if we made point an inline type instead, then line would look like this on the right. Since point is an inline type, it gets flattened inside its container. And we can see that X and Y for each point are flattened within line. Inline, inlining the points within line improves cache locality since the data is stored contiguously and footprint is reduced since we're avoiding some header overhead. It's important to keep in mind that inline types aren't always flattened since there are cases where flattening doesn't make sense. For example, if the inline type becomes too large to be allocated. However, the JVM will opt to flatten inline types as much as possible. All right, that's a quick overview of how flattening works. Now we'll go over the famous inline type slogan again, codes like a class works like an int. Another way to think about inline types is that they are faster, cheaper objects or programmable, richer primitives. Whichever way you prefer, their key primitive-like characteristics, identityless, immutable, and flattenable, enable them to be more efficiently stored in memory than traditional objects. And this is the performance improvement story. The language enhancement story comes from inline types having the class-like characteristics of structure, subtyping, encapsulation, among other aspects, which makes them more capable than primitives. All right, now that we have an understanding of what inline types are, let's look into how inline types are being implemented. We'll go over the learnings from the initial prototype for inline types called minimal value types. Then we'll look at the ongoing effort in the L world prototypes by looking at progress and implementation, benefits to the JIT and GC, and get some insight into handling errors and incompatibilities. Minimal value types, or MVT, was the initial prototype in developing inline types in Project Valhalla. At this point, inline types were referred to as value types, which were renamed to reduce semantic confusion since the word value holds meaning in both primitives and references. <laughs> 
but essentially value types were implemented as user-defined primitives at this point. They were developed in isolation from the Java object hierarchy as Q types. And that meant that inline types uh, had some issues. They were implemented as similarly to primitives as possible to reap as many of the performance benefits as primitives as possible. But that isolated type hierarchy and some of the weaknesses of primitives were also held by value types. So what was achieved with this prototype? Well, it was successful in proving the inline types concept to be beneficial. It proved memory footprint savings, data locality, reduction in memory traffic, and it demonstrated perf benefits. Overall, it confirmed the benefits of inlining and this optimal performance was made possible due to the isolated nature of how inline types were implemented. But like I said, that created some issues. So for some negatives, despite the performance wins of value types, they suffered from incidental identity, for example, when methods were called on them. So in order for a method to be called on a value type, the value type would get boxed into its reference type which meant that a heap allocation would occur, all the memory access costs associated with identity would come into effect. And as long as the incidental identity was in existence, the boxed object would be synchronized on, which could further complicate things. And once the method call was complete, the value type would be unboxed again. However, anything that depended on the values type, value type's incidental identity would have to deal with the reference no longer being defined. All that to say, incidental identity was a weakness of value types. Also, nine new bytecodes were introduced specifically for value types, so that increased JVM complexity. The separate, tire, separate type hierarchy where value types were isolated from javelin object meant that they couldn't be used with a lot of existing Java code, so lots of incompatibilities. Also, there was no Java C support for value types. And because of all these problems, MVT wasn't super usable, but the focus was less on the developer experience in this prototype and more on how the performance wins could be proven by implementing the core components in the JVM. So with both the pros and cons in mind, value types continued on and were renamed as inline types and entered the L world. The major change in this evolution was the merging of the inline type and traditional object hierarchies. So what does that mean? Well, the L in L world refers to the type signature letter that indicates objects in Java bytecode. For example, L Java lang string. In MVT, a new descriptor letter Q was introduced for inline types, but as we uh, just went over, the isolated type hierarchy posed some issues. Now in L world, inline types are joining the Java lang object hierarchy, merging into the L type descriptor world. This move shows that instead of building inline types as a separate user-defined primitive, we're now instead creating a special type of object. Additionally, instead of managing the new separate set of nine bytecodes for inline types, we reuse the existing bytecodes used for objects and just overload them for use with inline types. There are two bytecodes that are being carried over from the initial MVT prototype, and we'll go over that a little bit later. Overall, the changes in L world help alleviate the backwards compatibility issues that were rendering inline types quite unusable. So let's take a look at the new type hierarchy. Primitive types remain separate from this hierarchy and have to be boxed into the reference type to be used like an object. For example, an int would need to get boxed into a Java lang integer reference type in order to define methods on them. Inline types used to operate similarly to primitive types in MVT, separate from the object hierarchy. Now, inline types join reference types in subclassing javelin object and can implement interfaces and define methods. For bytecodes in L world, instead of a brand new set of nine bytecodes, these are the two that have been kept for exclusive use by inline types. One of them is default value, which is like the new bytecode for regular objects, and it creates an inline type with all the fields set to the default value for the fields type. So if it has a primitive type field, the default value would be zero. For reference type fields, the default would be null. And for any nested inline type fields, the default values for each of those nested fields would be used. 
The other byte code that has been kept is with field, which is basically put field, but for inline types. It creates a new inline type based on an existing inline type with the specified field updated. The other seven byte codes from MVT have been scrapped and inline types now reuse the existing byte codes for javelin objects. So now since the inline types have been merged into the hierarchy, just the traditional uh, byte codes need to be overloaded to support inline types. We'll briefly look at some examples of existing byte codes that have been overloaded to support inline types. Previously, these byte codes assumed to operate on types with identity and that each type had the size of a reference. But with inline types, we don't have identity and with flattening, the type size can be variable. So that means the ACOMP bytecodes can't just check if references are the same. They now need to check if both operands are inline types. And if that's the case, then equality means that all of the contents, so each field must be the same. For the array and field access and creation bytecodes, they need to know the storage size of the inline type to figure out how large an element is. But previously, only reference types were expected. So the architecture defined reference size was the expected size. There's also bytecodes that can't be used on inline types. So appropriate errors must be thrown in case they are. For example, inline types can't be null. So if a null is cast to an inline type, then a null pointer exception occurs. All right, now let's take a look at what inline types provide in LWorld. So instead of emulating user-defined primitives, the approach in LW1 and beyond revolves around enabling inline types to act as restricted classes. As a result, inline types can gain benefits of classes, such as calling methods, implementing interfaces, and extending abstract classes. At the same time, inline types are more restrictive than traditional classes in that they carry no identity, synchronization on instances is not possible, they cannot be subclassed, they are immutable, and they are not nullable. And although this seems like a long list of restrictions, these very limitations facilitate the performance advantage inline types have over traditional classes, such as field flattening for better memory layout and various optimizations, which I'll touch upon now. Avoiding keep allocation and synchronization on locks improves performance because it reduces memory allocation, memory access and GC activity, and that translates to improved execution time as well. Escape analysis is a JIT technique used to decide if an object should be heap allocated or not based on the scope of the object in the current method and thread. If the JIT can be certain that an object reference does not escape, it can opt to allocate the object on the stack and perform further optimizations, such as scalarization and registers. And that's where values are passed directly into registers instead of references. Escape analysis can get complicated, especially when synchronization on an object is in the picture, since the scope of an object can inflate drastically if it's referenced across threads. This complexity hinges on a core aspect of objects, having identity. Lucky for us, inline types are identityless, which means they can't be synchronized on and have a contained scope. And because of this important characteristic, inline types allow us to avoid heap allocations and synchronization and more readily make scalarization an option. Essentially, inline types allow us to disregard identity. Not having to worry about identity helps reduce the JIT analysis needed. And that helps the JIT have the flexibility to optimize even further. At the same time, this lack of identity is a major reason for the memory and GC benefits that inline types bring. Many of the JIT optimizations help eliminate heap allocations when possible. In the case of inline types, it's much more probable to avoid heap allocations. And even if we do heap allocate, we can expect a smaller allocation compared to traditional objects. The need for less memory comes from reducing or completely avoiding having a header for the inline type. This is because inline types do not have a mark word, which is used for locking. And that already removes half of the usual header allocation needed. The other half of the header will only be present if the inline type doesn't get flattened. So if an inline type is flattened, its header is completely eliminated, 
Lastly, the aggregate inline format of inline types helps improve data locality, and that helps reduce memory access latency and avoids pointer chasing. Now let's think about errors. Introducing new language features involves some considerations for error and incompatibility handling. It's important to figure out a good way to notify the developer when they're using the feature incorrectly. Compile time checks can only go so far since knowledge about static types is all that's available. As such, Java C can only provide so much protection from inline types misuse. Runtime exceptions allow us to crash or halt once an incompatibility is detected. This helps us communicate to the developer when an inline type isn't used correctly and prevents the program from progressing into undefined territory. For example, if the application code tries to set an inline type to null, then a null pointer exception would occur. There's also silent failures, but they're not great. They may allow the program to continue running, but the behavior of the program becomes undefined and things can get corrupted or fail somewhere down the line and it becomes unclear what caused the demise in the first place. So probably not the best course of action. Fortunately for inline types, silent failures were not pursued for error handling. So to summarize, once again, inline types are essentially faster, cheaper objects or programmable richer primitives. So you think codes like a class works like an int. They enable fewer indirections because they allow for inline object arrays and flatten fields and flattening reduces header overhead. Inline types also helps us avoid heap allocations, which reduces GC pressure. And lastly, it's easier for the JIT to stack allocate pursue scalarization and attempt other optimizations because inline types don't have identity. In the grand scheme of the Valhalla project, all the inline types work thus far is early access and the specifics of the implementation are constantly evolving. Currently, experimental development of inline types is in the LW3 and beyond prototype stage with a production release targeted for LW10 and a fully featured, tested and validated LW100 which would be the completion of the Valhalla project. Some recent updates to the inline type story include a couple JDK enhancement proposals or JEPs, namely JEP 401, primitive objects, which is where inline types are being evolved into primitive classes or objects. This is a, essentially a renaming of inline types, uh, and it does include other changes such as using the primitive keyword to denote a primitive class. There's also JEP 402, unify the basic primitives with objects. And this is where basic primitives like int will be treated as primitive classes or objects. As development continues, two major considerations remain top of mind, performance and usability of inline types. Ideally, these concepts would simply play nicely with each other. However, there are implementation trade-offs that must be made so that both sides of the story can be realized as we've discussed today. With user-defined primitives and minimal value types, the performance angle was the primary focus. The restricted classes approach of LW1 and beyond drives the usability aspect much further while diligently working to uplift performance at the same time. Closing the performance gap while maintaining usability characterizes the ambition of Valhalla although restricted classes are theoretically unlikely to outperform user-defined primitives. As the ongoing development of inline types unfolds, intermingling tactical design and implementation choices continues to be crucial in balancing the often competing objectives of performance and usability. All right, well, that concludes my talk today. If you're interested in trying out an early access Valhalla build, you can check out this URL here. And for more detailed information about the Valhalla project and inline types work, there's this document here. Thank you very much.